welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. The place for all things guitar and gear. Here are your hosts, Chris, Jesse, and Robert. Welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, your fortnightly webcast for all things guitar and gear. I'm Chris, and with me tonight is Jesse. Hello. And... Uh, well, Jesse, what have you been up to this week on uh, guitars? <laughs> uh, kind of a smorgasbord of things. Yeah. Uh, trying to fit some guitar in in between. Uh, spring continues to spring. <laughs> it's actually turned into summer. <laughs> so, like, I'm hiking and biking and running and doing all these other things. It just leaves painfully little time for guitar. Um, but um, continuing on the acoustic guitar bit, um, trying to get my hands in shape. Um, calluses are coming along nicely. Nice. Um, playing a little bit of blues here and there. And um, just kind of reminding myself of all the scales and some of the uh, my old repertory that I used to just play and sing and enjoy and, you know, so, which is good, you know, good times on the guitar. Nothing really new. But that's cool. And for you? Uh, two things, really. Um, working on Over the Hills. No. Uh-oh. Over the Hills and Far Away? Over the Hills and Far Away. Yes. Okay. You know, I was like... Wow, you must have been working really hard on that song if you forgot the title. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, you know, here's the thing. Um, I looked at the lyrics for the song, and I'm not 100% sure why it's called Over the Hills and Far Away. Yeah, Zeppelin was weird that way. <laughs> so, listeners, if you know, please post a comment uh, on our YouTube channel or include it in feedback on iTunes or whatever the case might be. Why is the song called Over the Hills and Far Away? Of course, there's a lot of Led Zeppelin songs. I have no re- like, you know, clue why the title is the title. It's true. But in this one in particular, it's a fun song so far. I'm still working on the intro, which is done on acoustic. I'm going to be working on it both with an acoustic and an electric, mm-hmm. but probably focus on the electric because I want to play the song straight through and it don't really want to be in a position where I'm changing guitars. and Oh, um, just banging out on acoustic. Oh, yeah. yeah right. <laughs> da, 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 da. Da, da. right. Sure. Sure. <laughs> and I know, like, you know, uh, yeah, it's, this is like the era of multi tracking and stuff like that. So, you know, that's, there's lots of different guitar things going on. Right. So, <laughs> uh, so I'm going to identify the parts I want to play, and then we're just going to play those. <laughs> and then I can learn the other uh, tracks if I, if I so desire. So I'm uh, having a good time with it. I'm getting the rhythm down, and it's, uh, it's, I didn't realize how fast that song was until I tried to play that song. That yeah. intro, there are some fast parts. There's some fast pull-offs on the uh, G string that mm-hmm. uh, it's like a, a fourth fret, second fret, uh, open string pull-off that they just he just whoops right out. Yep. And um, sort of getting that so it sounds good and making sure I get all the strings and don't sacrifice a, a note because I'm playing too fast. Mm-hmm. I was actually skipping a note and didn't realize it. And I was like, I can't get this rhythm down. It's all over the place. And my instructor goes, oh, you're, you're missing an open D. I'm like, oh. And as soon as I include the open D, it's like, oh, well, it's just kind of falling right into place now. You know, that, that one wrong missed note yep. uh, was a big deal. Um, the other thing I've been working on this past week or so has been uh, getting back into some recording. And I have a goal for myself this summer. I want to record two songs. And I don't know how I'm going to accomplish that goal. Like, I might get one and a half songs. I might get, you know, three quarters of a song. I'm going to define a song to be two minutes of playing. Mm -hmm. Because I'm new at this. And I don't want to, you know, have this, like... 20 minute, like, you know, uh, early Metallica <laughs> thing, you know, where they're. <laughs> My two songs are going to be a uh, relayer from Yes. <laughs> right, right. You know, not like, you know, some of the stuff on Masters of Puppets or something like that. Master of Puppets. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, you know, a good solid two minutes. And then what I've been working on is uh, recording multiple tracks. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I, when you recorded the intro for, uh, for the show, I was watching how you were doing it. And that inspired me. I'm like, okay, now I, I start to see how you were doing it by, you know, recording a bit of this track and then using multiple tracks in GarageBand to put the parts together. I'm like, okay, I think I can do that. And in the summer is when I've had a chance to really sit down and think about it. So I recorded something that's close to a minute long, and I hate about 75% of it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but that's okay because it was a dry run in order to try to figure out, you know, in GarageBand how to do um, what it is that I want to do. Yeah. And I, lost it. I don't even know what it can do. So I'm at the like the level of if I select this region and drag it out, what happens? Right. Apparently it's a loop. Yeah. Garage, I guess right? it depends on how you define it. I, I'm not sure. I'm not a Mac person, so I'm not that into GarageBand. But I know like in Acid uh, and some other uh workstations if you in if you drag it one way like holding in the shift key or something it'll loop it if you do it another way it'll actually stretch the audio which will change the tempo you can do it that oh, way yeah see, i figured there was a way of doing that too yeah uh, look, read the manual cuz it's probably in there <laughs> google searches look for good youtube videos that explain how to use it um so yeah so i don't even know what i don't know at this point right and, and so I figured the best way of finding this stuff out is just to jump in, start messing around, and then eventually find that you know, I've been doing it the hard way and then learn the easier way and then yet another easier way. And even like what the capabilities are, um, how to lay down a proper drum track or, you know, whatever the case might be. Yeah, there's all kinds. Of, I don't know what's out there in, in terms of freeware. Well, GarageBand has a drummer kind of built in, right? I mean, that's yeah. I bought the like the drummer expansion pack or whatever, and okay. they have it's, it's Apple, so there's all these hip, cool names for these guys. It's not like you know, Joe. You know, it's like <laughs> it's I Animal. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like they're fancy names, you know, oh. they're sophisticated names. Mephisto. I can't, I can't even think of them off the top of my head, but uh, no, but there's a couple, you know straightforward names too as well but uh so I, you know, i'm like you know this guy i don't know what he plays so and i have this they have this description but it doesn't mean much to me so i just start pushing buttons and turning dials and see what sounds come out and yeah yeah it's a real basic level of this stuff right now trying to figure out what's going on yeah well that's good i mean it yeah, see, unfortunately, I, when I got first got into it, it was like everything was just analog tape. I mean, my first multi-track experience, did I ever tell you this story? Was no. recording my son. This was, Okay, I was in eighth grade, so, <laughs> so this was a long freaking time ago. <laughs> but it's like record on a cassette machine, play that back on one cassette machine while playing that into another cassette machine while at the same time recording my second part. So every time you did that, you, you gained a whole other generation of uh, noise and distortion and wow, wow yeah. and flutter. I mean, it was pretty much the old Buddy Holly 50s way of doing multi-tracking, you know. Um, they actually just had come out with like uh, cassette four tracks at that point. But of course, I was a kid and didn't have enough, didn't have any wherewithal to get that. It was a whoa when I could get one, you know. But uh, of course, now it's just all on the computer, which is awesome. Yeah, you just highlight stuff you don't want to hit the delete key. <laughs> That's all. true. Although oh, there's, oh, there's undo. <laughs> yeah, there's undo. There's undo yeah, the as thing, well. The other thing is we've kind of lost the ability, I think. Well, I shouldn't say that because some people, you know, one take all the way through is still the way it is. But a lot of performers, now we, we assemble music. You know, it's like if you get a verse or even less than that, I mean, you can just boom. Okay, that verse is good. Now, copy, paste, boom, boom. Now we've got the three verses and you can and you just assemble it. And then, of course, overdubbing isn't, okay, roll through the whole song. It's just, um, okay, I want to overdub this one little part. Then you just move it into position, copy it wherever it needs to go. And, and that's kind of what I was doing. So what yeah. I did, I, I established three tracks, right? And I mm -hmm. had an intro, a track for an intro, and then I had a track for what I would just naively call a rhythm and a lead. Yeah. Okay. And so I would have an intro section, and then I would record the rhythm, and then re and then I would record the lead over top of the – and I would basically just go back to the beginning of the song, mm -hmm. play it through. Once it was the time to play the um, the lead, I would play the lead over top of the rhythm. And I know with GarageBand, you can start wherever you want mm -hmm. and hit record. But I liked the idea of listening to the first part of the song to sort of get into the, the groove, if you will, of what it is I wanted to play. Because I was making it up all – I'm not I'm not writing this stuff down. I'm just – play i'm just improvising right yeah and um then maybe i would you know after i thought of leading the rhythm maybe i would have another sort of track that i would record on that intro track right and then you know another bit and then do another rhythm and lead part or whatever and just sort of messing around you know and there's a couple of parts that i was like after i got done i played it back it's like terrible don't like mm, kind of like that i don't really like that you know and 
So I called it a Blues and B draft one, and I'm sure I will be copying and pasting that the parts I like into other new songs later. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, I like that lead part. Stick it there, you know, or whatever. Oh, absolutely. I think – I'm not sure if GarageBand does this. I, I imagine it does. You can set up a loop where let's say you're at the solo sp- uh, spot, you know, and uh, or even just any kind of lick that you just want to get right. There's a little fill in there where you can set up a loop where it will play back that original track and then it will record a track through there. And then when it gets to the end of the loop, it goes back to the beginning, opens up another track, and then you just keep playing. So you could try 20 takes. And it just automatically keeps adding takes. And then when you finally get the right one after take – when your case, take two. In mine, maybe 102. (laughs) And then it's like – then you can just delete the other 101 tracks and you have the good one. I'll have to look at that because it probably does that. I don't know. The other thing that I've, uh, I want to figure out, and this might be straightforward or it might be hard, and I, I have no sense, is to record 12 bars mm-hmm. and then loop that in such a way that the end of the 12th bar seamlessly goes into the oh, yeah. you know, first bar. And right now what, has, what I've been doing is there's been a bit of a pause. Yeah. And I think it's because of the way I'm playing or the way I'm looping. I'm not 100% sure how I'm stitching things together. I'm not 100% sure. But you know, I think with a little bit of you know an hour or two of, of, of messing around with it, I think I can sort of figure that out as well. Right. Uh, but I've been trying to keep my Wednesday nights sacred as recording guitar nights. That's cool. That's, That's what kind you of need. what I want to do this summer. Yeah, it's just sort of keep it for that because – Wednesday night's not a good drinking night, you know. It's not a good going out <laughs> night. So, what else am I going to do but sit here and play guitar? That's true. Um, so yeah, so that's that's sort of what I've been been working on and plan to continue to work on o- along the way over the hills and far away. I'm hoping to just get that developed and get back to the idea of playing songs again as part of my lesson, so that I can start practicing all of the stuff that I've been working on as technique. Right. And stuff like get those pull offs because you know when when you get that uh, that triple pull off there, then the next step could be uh, the crazy train because that does the same pull off just on three strings. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that was a hard, that was one of the hardest things that I, when I learned that song, I was just like I can't get those. You know, I would cheat it and just do like you know one finger pull off <laughs> instead of the triplets. But yeah. Right. Cool. Sweet. Well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the things I think we should point out is that just a few days ago on May 8th was Robert Johnson's 104th birthday. He was born May 8th, 1911. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the interesting things about Robert, well, let's just say who Robert Johnson is. For those of you, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably know who Robert Johnson is. King right? of the Delta Blues singer. Right. <laughs> just in case. The guy was the pioneer of uh, of the Delta Blues and of the blues in general. You know, I mean, he um, he only recorded for, I think, about a year of his career. Mm-hmm. recorded about 29 songs, 30 songs, something like that. And uh, I think it was from 37 to 38, I think, is when he was doing his recording. And, you know, if you look at blues players since then, you know, and you look at what they play, you're going to see some common songs, right? You're going to mm-hmm. see Love in Vain Blues. You're going to see Sweet Home Chicago. You're going to see Crossroad Blues. You're going to see I Believe I dust my, I'll Dust My Broom, right? And, and, and many others. And all of these go back to Robert Johnson. Mm-hmm. And it's quite amazing that that stuff that he recorded in the 30s holds up today. And oh, people yeah. today go back. People, artists as recent as, you know, the Red Hot Chili Peppers and, and these folks go back and they say, you know, I was influenced by Robert Johnson. Oh, yeah. And you can hear it in so much. His rhythms and the syncopation that he has in the right hand is like you can hear that through, well, the Stones and, and even more modern stuff. I mean, it's. Yeah, he wrote the book on a lot of stuff that's a part of rock and blues and, you know, everything today. Yeah, and, and you know, these turnarounds that you hear now that are that almost are cliche status, mm-hmm. right, were revolutionary at the time. Oh, yeah. It was a huge deal. And, uh, you know, we know very little about this man's life because of his circumstances. You know, people weren't writing about him. Right. You know, as an African American in the Great Depression, he just well, he was under the radar. I mean, nobody under, cared yeah. about these people in the in the Delta, and but uh, 
Yeah. yeah. It's funny because my first exposure to Robert Johns was actually the movie Crossroads. Have you ever seen this movie? I don't think so. We need to have a movie night. Okay. <laughs> You'll love this movie. So just real quick, it's uh, this uh, Juilliard classical guitar player played by Ralph Macchio of all people. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, I know. It's actually a little sad, but he does a good job. Okay. The guitar parts are actually recorded. And he was coached by Ry Cooter, I think. So, I mean, there was some good playing going on. And uh, so, but he loves the blues. So after he's done with his classical studies, he plays the blues and everything. And he meets up with this harmonica player, wine, uh, blind Willie Johnson, um, who I guess sold his soul to the devil. And so Macho deals with old Scratch himself to try to get his uh, his – Soul back and uh, ends up having to do a guitar duel with, uh, I guess, Satan's own little guitar player played by Steve Vai. <laughs> and they have this blowout guitar duel at the end, which lately I, you know, I've gone back and seen it. It's on YouTube, the, the duel at the end, you know, and it's like, OK, so by modern post 80s, you know, where everybody's speed picking and sweeping and, you know, all that, it, it's not doesn't blow your mind quite as much as it did when the movie was out, but uh, it's pretty hot. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we got to watch that because it's comedic in parts, of course, but uh, you know it has to do with a lot of that mystery of oh, he's looking for like two lost Robert Johnson recordings. Okay, apparently there are two songs out there that, that were recorded and nobody knew where they were and everything, and that's what he went down there for. And uh, so. Which I, I think that's a total fiction. I, I don't know if that's part of the mystique. But they get into a lot of that mystery where apparently he, he disappeared for a little while and came back and just all, all had all this talent. You know, and I don't know how much of that legend was, you know, he just woodshedded or <laughs> yeah. it was just totally, you know, built from whole cloth. Well, the legend is, of course, or the uh, the myth is that, you know, he went to the crossroads and sold his soul to right. the devil to get these overnight guitar skills you know yeah. but according from what i had read something that you know according to the people who knew him they basically said no i mean this is not an overnight success story the man worked his tail off mm -hmm. you know playing street corners juke joints just anywhere he could play to get his craft to the level that he got it to mm -hmm. um and, and of course that's probably the reality of of you know how he got to be so good i mean how else do you get to that level but you're playing all the time but because there's so little known about him, like there's just, just a lot of myths that crop up that are kind of fun. Like, you know, one of the myths about the way he died is that um, he was poisoned by a jealous boyfriend. Right. So he was basically, uh, you know, seeing a girl that he probably shouldn't have been seeing and uh, got himself in a little bit of trouble. Um, and you know, there's another story that goes along with that, that it took him a while to die. And while he was in the process of dying, there was a famous um, talent scout at the time who was looking for him to go play Carnegie Hall. Oh, wow. And the name of the scout, I actually have it, uh, I looked it up earlier today, was John Hammond, which meant, meant nothing to me. Right. Uh, but because, I mean, my my knowledge of talent scouts of the 1930s is just... <laughs> Somewhat lacking. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, it's essentially zero except for now John Hammond, uh, who was apparently you know, a legend in the field. I have no idea. But um, truth be told, you know, it's just another one of those cool stories that pops up, whether it's true or not. Who knows? We'll never know. But this guy that attains this mythological status mm -hmm. uh, because of his talents. Um, so wherever you are, Robert Johnson, happy birthday. And happy thanks. Birthday. Keep playing the blues. Yes, and thank you for, for what you did, for sure. Jamming with Jimmy up there. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, that's, uh, that would be a sight. Oh, yeah. Jimmy, Stevie, Robert. Yeah. All the other guys. Yeah. Hope they have a good power setup up there. Well, it's heaven. You'd think they would. Yeah. You're plugged into Cloud9 over here. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh the other thing i thought we would just uh maybe i don't know if we want to get into this or not we're we're pretty good in time but uh uh i was reading an article earlier today um uh, many of our listeners probably are aware of it but this was new to me actually was the origin of ibanez and lawsuit guitars yeah and so what i had learned and, and please correct me if i'm wrong uh, was that Ibanez basically got their start making knockoffs of Gibson guitars. Yeah, that's, that's as I understand it. 
And uh, there were several other Japanese companies at the time doing the exact same thing. They were making knockoff of Fender and, mm -hmm. and Ivan, or, or excuse me, of Gibson. And that uh, the claim that of the article that I was reading was that people sort of migrated over to them because they were inexpensive. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the article had claimed that in the 70s at this point in time, there was a dip in the production quality of, oh, of yeah. the American guitars. And so that these Japanese models were coming in as good. And then, and, and according to this art, this article's author, and these things are always subjective, right? Sure. Yeah. But uh, that even better quality than what was being produced by the American manufacturers um, at the time. And so that these guitars became high demand. People were very much interested in them. Um, but Ibanez gets sued and basically decides to stop producing knockoff copies. And of course, come out with a line of very successful guitars they've come up with on their own that we we see many players uh playing right i'm not sure if that was the start of ibanez um or if th that's just where they kind of got known where they where they started taking a part of the market i think they had some cheap guitars before that but they weren't something that you'd buy i mean they were inexpensive and whatever and then when um just of lesser quality you know and then they when they copied the designs and that's kind of part of that myth that's like the japanese are awesome at like copying things maybe not so right. much in creativity until of course they got into creativity and they just blew things away you know um, but yeah ibanez and takai and there are i think there are some others that, that did that and uh yeah there was a time i know my um my college uh roomie um well friend anyway had a an american strat and uh, he was a Strat guy, loved him and everything. And I was not impressed, <laughs> actually, of the Strat at the time, you know. Um, I mean, it was good. It was all right. But it's like, yeah, it's, I think for the money we were paying at, at that time in history, it just wasn't. Not that they were bad guitars, just they, they weren't the deal that you can get like now, <laughs> you know. And yeah, the Japanese really, uh, really came along and did something with it. Well, from what I understand, too, and again... Uh, this is just reading a couple, uh, article or two, so it, and I don't know how well they were researched. So you know, mm -hmm. uh, so please correct me if I'm wrong, listeners. Please feel free to post um, comments. But uh, for I understand that you know, Fender and Gibson, in after this all oh, it started or happened, began to leverage these you know quality production factories in in Asia and mm -hmm. Japan, and by doing things like you know Gibson buying Epiphone and Fender starting Squire and say, look, we've got this talent pool over here in Asia making these pretty good quality guitars you know let's leverage that let's buy up some of these people or open up some of our own factories over there and start making some um, successful uh sort of entry level or even better than entry level but inexpensive guitars compared to you know your your two thousand dollar plus gibson right. Paul, in the case might be. yeah actually i never uh, put that together that's that's interesting that makes a lot of sense you know when you have this uh, production you know capability and talent at, at that price uh, why not take advantage of it? Because certainly you're going to do better than the other competitors who, who don't. Right. And certainly if you don't, they're going to. <laughs> so, I mean. And if they're already making the knockoff copies mm -hmm. and they're doing a good job, then why not just buy them, put them under your wing and sure. say, all right, now you're making less balls. Yeah. Right. Or now you're making a strat. We won't call it the American standard, but, you know, we'll call it the bullet or, or whatever. Right. right. That's uh, um, that they have. So, um, so anyway, it was an interesting article that I'd read and, uh, was talking about these different things. So the way I came across the article was, uh, somebody on the guitar subreddit had posted a picture of a, what do you call a lawsuit guitar that they had redone. Mm -hmm. As of, I've never heard of lawsuit guitars before. What is this? And sure enough, it was this Ibanez Les Paul copy. Yeah. And, and the thing that he, uh, I assume it was he had posted was just, you know, in horrible shape, it was missing the pickups and just the body was all torn up and, yeah. and uh, basically showed the step-by-step -step process where they made it better. Yeah. And a nice looking guitar. And apparently these are a thing on eBay. Um, these lawsuit guitars are a thing to, uh, people are sort of are interested in getting. And so of course, once someone's interested in getting something, the knockoffs, start to happen. So like, wait, wait, wait a minute. Knockoffs of knockoffs. Yeah. <laughs> so the question, so when you say people are interested, are these driving the prices like way up to like silly levels? I didn't look. That's I know there are some older Ibanez's that are, are um, I mean, if you can get them in really good, you know, mint condition can command like really high prices. And um, 
more than you would pay for something new, <laughs> you know, that would be a commensurate quality, which then it's kind of like, well, I don't get the point then because it's not – I guess anything's collectible if people want it. So it's really a weird thing. You know, but in the end, the people who won were us, the players. That's true. Yeah, because the manufacturing has just gotten good. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can go in, you can get a guitar under 500 bucks, in some cases under 300 bucks, and walk off with an outstanding yeah. guitar. What's interesting, too, is that um, the thing that they ended up um, being able to not copy is the headstock. I mean, everything else, you can pretty much, as far as I understand it, nobody's ever held a lawsuit about the body shape or about, I mean, that stuff's just, it is, it's there. Right. Um, it's that if you have that double scroll Gibson top, you know, you can't do that. And so they all modify it to some slight degree um, or, or maybe to a great degree and create their own. But I mean, the, the body can be that single cutaway and be just like a Paul. Um with all the same construction techniques and, you know, sound that you get from that. Same with the Strat. You just can't do the Strat headstock. And, right. um, yeah, so that, that's kind of funny because everything else is pretty much the same guitar if you want. But, this, you know, guitars are limited things. How many it's, ways can you put this together? Right. You know, it has to go in a certain place on the body. You have to be able to get your arms around it. you got to be able to, you know, there's things you have to be able to do with it. And that's going to restrict the variety of shapes and sizes that you're going to be able to make and have a playable guitar that's true right yeah the article didn't mention it was the headstock that was sort of driving the lawsuit i don't know that it initially was but okay. i know that the things that stuck over time that's what it ended up being that that's the thing that to this day you can't copy not legally right very very interesting stuff so yeah so this is uh the show is sort of more about uh Less about playing guitars and more about – that's why we call it the, the webcast for all things guitar and gear. Yes, because we are gearheads, you know. Yes. So, well, I think I'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and wrap this show up. Uh, this is actually episode 20. So for those of you who have stuck us stuck it out with us and listened to all 20, thank you. Thank you very much. We love you guys. Yes. <laughs> thank so you, girls. Episode 20. Yes. Woo. And as always, please, please, if you like what you hear, click like on YouTube, hit subscribe, subscribe to us on iTunes, leave us some feedback. We'd love to hear what you think. And a review. And a review. Absolutely. You know, click the number of stars you think we should have and just let us know what we're doing well. And if there's something you'd like us to talk about, send us a message. Uh, six strings at gmail.com, I think is our email address, which is very <laughs> embarrassing because I should know that. I tell you what, hit us up on Twitter at SST show. That one I do know because I mess around with <laughs> a lot more than the mail account. And uh, just, you know, hit us up and just say, hey, talk about this or hey, you know, whatever, whatever you'd like to do. All right. So uh, until next time, everybody, just keep picking and grinning. Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure is a production of Jester Cat Studios. You can see more about this and all other JesterCat shows at JesterCat.com. You can also email the show at SST at JesterCat.com or continue the conversation on Twitter at SST Show. You can follow Robert at RS Macy, Jesse at Jester700, and Chris at CW Culp. Thanks to Jesse for playing and recording our intro music. 